I am going to talk today about chipsets, which is something that I've tried to avoid talking too much about throughout the semester with limited success. But um, chipsets, as many of you are well aware, um, these are very, very small satellites. So gram scale spacecraft that would fit in your wallet. These are the things I did my PhD on. So um, what I'm going to deliver today is I thought about taking my dissertation defense and sort of massaging it into a lecture format. I actually decided to just keep it exactly the same. So I'm giving you literally the dissertation defense and I'm doing this because it would have been the same content if I had massaged it into more of a lecture format. And it also occurred to me that some of you might be thinking about doing PhDs in this field. And it might be kind of interesting to see what a dissertation defense in this field can look like. Uh, Cause I had no idea, right? When I started this and they all look very different. Of course, Dean's will look much different than, than mine looks, but I thought it might be interesting for folks that are finishing up undergraduate or finishing up a master's to just see what a dissertation in aerospace engineering can look like in case you're trying to decide whether or not you want to do these things. So partially for that reason too, I decided to just keep the format exactly the same. So I will start, well, I'll start by saying, what's the point of a, a PhD dissertation? The, the idea of a PhD, the hope at least is that in order to receive a PhD, you are supposed to have made contributions to your field of study. So you're supposed to have advanced your field of study in one way or another. Um, and the, the point of the dissertation defense is to very carefully articulate what those contributions to the field were in your estimation and to defend them. So when you go to a PhD dissertation, what you'll hear is the person giving the presentation will say, I made X, Y, and Z contributions to my field of study. And then the whole, the whole talk is defending or, or articulating why you think those contributions were made. And then throughout the committee interrupts and sort of pokes them and, and you know, tries to trip them up and that sort of thing. Um, but so that's what this talk is. So in particular, the contributions that I defend here are listed uh, here. So I will argue that throughout the PhD, the contributions that I've made include um, the articulation of a new field of study within aerospace engineering, which I've given maybe the bad name of our selected spacecraft. The name might not be so good, but I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, advanced the state of the art for chipsets. Came up with an algorithm that optimally routes data through a planar swarm of chipsets. Um, identified and explored the first translational research application for chipsets in digital agriculture. So put satellites in vineyards and on cows instead of in space. Be kind of interesting. And then um, one of the early activities for my PhD was an optical navigation problem that I don't talk about in this presentation because I presented it in an earlier presentation to my committee. So there were no updates. So this is what I'm going to talk about, but I will actually be happy if at the end of this presentation, you understand the answers to the following questions. These are the questions that I actually care to talk about. Uh, I would like for everyone by the end of this to understand what a chipset is, why they're interesting and what they're good for. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do. Can you guys hear that leaf blower? Okay, good. <laughs> so what are chipsets? Uh, they're very, very small satellites. So they're satellites that would fit in your wallet. The notion is that they can be carried to space by the hundreds or the thousands or the hundreds of thousands or the millions um, to be deployed as free flying spacecraft. And then once deployed, each uses a suite of onboard sensors to take environmental measurements and then uses a radio to communicate those measurements both to other chipsets in a network and back down to receiver stations. So they are, this is perhaps an obvious point. They're very, very different from conventional spacecraft. And they're different in some ways that are very obvious and in some ways that are more subtle. So I wanna spend quite a bit of time, or a bit of time at least, talking about these differences between chipsets and conventional satellites. But every difference that I'm gonna talk about boils down to one fundamental observation which is that an individual chipset is useless. So if I were to take an individual chipset and put it into space, I would get almost no value from that. The data rate from these things is so low 
from individual chipsets. The data rate is so low that it's bordering on useless. And individual chipsets are also really susceptible to dying. Um, they, can be, they can die from radiation exposure. They can die from a litany of other risks. So the lifetime expectation of, a, of an individual chipset can be quite low. And the data rate out of these things can be quite low. So an individual chipset is not useful. What is useful is a lot of them. If you deploy a lot of chipsets in space, the data rate from the whole collective is actually competitive with the data rate that you would expect from a conventional satellite. Um, and it's data of an entirely different type, right? It's a, it's a data set from a very spatially distributed area as opposed to a data set from a, from a single spacecraft at a single point in space. So actually, if, if what a spacecraft is, is a thing that does something useful in space, then the spacecraft, so to speak, is actually the collective. And the individual chipset is a component of the collective, which is the actual tool. The tool is the collective. So if you think about a collection of chipsets as, a, a, as the tool that we're studying in space, you can consider the open research questions associated with that tool. And they're kind of interesting. They're questions kind of like those written here. So they're questions along the lines of, how do you route data among a collection of chipsets? How do you send a command to hundreds of thousands of spacecraft? Uh, how do you execute maneuvers with these spacecraft? So how do you get the collection to change its shape, for example? Um, how do you do attitude control with chipsets? That's a non-trivial question. So th this list of questions is interesting for a couple reasons. It's interesting, first of all, because there's a lot of them. So that's kind of interesting in its own right. It's also interesting because these questions are extremely fundamental in nature. These questions like this have been answered for conventional satellites since basically the 50s and 60s, right? So there's something that's different about chipsets that's bringing us back to a very, very fundamental set of questions. Yeah, so why is this research landscape interesting? There are a lot of open questions and those questions are uniquely fundamental in nature. So my contention here is that this indicates something interesting. To me, this indicates that list of open research questions and its fundamental nature, to me is a clue that chipsets should not be thought of as an incremental improvement upon existing technology. So they shouldn't be thought of as the smallest example of a spacecraft. I think they're actually a different type of technology entirely. And I think that difference is best articulated in, uh, in the language of ecologists, actually. So some of you all, some of you all have seen a couple of these slides before from, from previous semesters, but the argument goes like this. Um, some of you may recall this concept of R selection and K selection from a high school biology or ecology class. And for those of you that don't, because it's been a long time, I'm going to review it. But the, the observation here is that every species on earth has the same problem to solve. And that problem is make sure enough of your offspring survive to the next generation in order to perpetuate the species. You can't have an untenable number of your population die off from one generation to the next generation or the whole species dies out. So this is the problem that we all have to solve. Evolution has arrived at basically two solutions to this problem. It's kind of a spectrum, but we can talk about it as two solutions. One of the solutions to which nature has arrived to solve this problem is case selection. And the, um, hold on, I just wanna make sure I started recording. Sorry, just a second. Uh, yeah, I'm recording, okay. So, so one, of these, uh, one of the solutions to this problem is case selection. This is the strategy that we employ as human beings. It's also the strategy that's employed by things like whales and penguins and um, primates. But the solution is produce very few offspring in your lifetime and devote tremendous energy and effort to each of those offspring in order to maximize the probability of success, right? So we all live with our parents for something around 18 years. Maybe for some people it's more, for some people it's less. But a tremendous amount of energy is devoted to human children in order to guarantee their, their uh, to, to improve their likelihood for success. This works extremely well, right? As evidenced by our existence. There's another solution, however, 
which is employed by things like species like rabbits and octopus sea turtles. And the R selection solution is produce huge amounts of offspring and devote almost no energy to any of them and just have enough that probabilistically, statistically, you can guarantee that some number will survive, right? So in an evolutionary sense, a sea turtle knows when she lays a thousand eggs that a very, very, very small number of those eggs are actually gonna survive to adulthood. But that's okay as far as the sea turtle is concerned because she'll just have many thousands of offspring. So that critical number will be maintained. So the argument's probably, or the analogy is probably obvious at this point, but, but here it is. Um, we have a similar problem to solve in spacecraft engineering. Our goal is to make sure that enough spacecraft survive to accomplish the mission. And my argument is that every spacecraft launched to date has been case selected, which is to say a spacecraft engineer produces very few spacecraft in his or her lifetime. It's not uncommon for a, a spacecraft engineer to devote an entire career to one or two spacecraft, right? So you, do, you, you spend a huge amount of time and energy in order to try to maximize the likelihood that that spacecraft is going to survive and accomplish the mission. And this has been unbelievably successful, right? Because th this is the strategy that we've used to date to explore and in interrogate space, right? So it's rewritten the textbooks on, you know, everything space related. My argument, however, is that nature shows us this is not the only option. And the thing that makes chipsets fundamentally different from conventional satellites, the reason that that list of open research questions is so fundamental in nature, I think, is because they're the first example of an R-selected spacecraft. So it's not an iterative improvement on an existing uh, spacecraft model. It's a new solution to the mission assurance problem. So with chipsets, we produce very, very large quantities of spacecraft and devote extremely little time, energy, and money to any one of them, but we launch enough to statistically guarantee their survival. So that's the idea. And I'll mention briefly that the reason, a reason, probably the major reason, that we've never seen this strategy employed in spacecraft exploration before is it takes a spacecraft of a very particular type in order to employ this technique, right? You need to be able to mass produce them very, very cheaply. And until pretty recently, until basically the past decade, that's been economically impossible to do. The only reason that we can now produce spacecraft like this is largely due to other industries. The cell phone industry is a big one, right? So they're producing millions and billions of cell phones every year. So by economies of scale, the cost of things like printed circuit board manufacturing um, and assembly and these surface mounted electronics, they are unbelievably cheap compared to what they used to be. And it is because of these under, other industries that we can now manufacture spacecraft that share some of these properties, right? So that's why we haven't seen this solution employed before, I think. But I think it's the other reason that the, the list of open questions associated with the spacecraft is so fundamental. So my argument again is these chipsets for all these reasons, they do not represent an incremental improvement of existing technology. They represent an entirely new, new paradigm in spacecraft and spacecraft mission design. Which raises this question of, you know, in sort of the evolutionary history of spacecraft, where is it appropriate to place a chipset? And if you think about the individual chipset as the spacecraft, which I've already said, I don't think is the correct way to think about it, then you might be tempted to do something like this where you, you, we'd start with Sputnik and go to Explorer 1, decades and decades of work towards small satellites. You might say that the current state of the art for small satellites upon which the chipset is an improvement might be a CubeSat, right? And maybe you would place the chipset down here. But I don't think that's right. Because like I said, this, this implies that an individual chipset is useful and it's not. It's only the collection that's useful. So the thing that we're thinking about in placing it in this sort of evolutionary history is the collection of chipsets. This also implies that the fundamental innovation associated with the chipset is a reduction of mass. And I'd argue that that's actually not also particularly correct. I think the innovation is in a fractionation of mass. When you launch a collection of chipsets, the total, the total launch mass is going to be 
close to the same if you want to do anything useful as a conventional satellite, a single conventional satellite, but that mass is fractionated among a whole bunch of chipsets. So for both those reasons, I don't think this is correct. So then where do you put the collection of chipsets? I don't know exactly, but somewhere early on is my argument. And th so this is my argument for why these represent a new field of study. They are an iterative improvement upon existing technologies. It's an entirely new paradigm in accessing and exploring space. And also for that reason, they in no way replace conventional satellites. They have a different set of use cases. So these are a new way to access and explore space and they open up a new set of mission opportunities that are distinct from those that conventional satellites are useful for. That's the argument. Um, I am not the first person to think about small satellites. Uh, people have been thinking about small satellites for a long time. And I'm also not the first person to, um, to build these small satellites. So this is sort of the, a pictorial history of chipsets uh, that goes back as far as 2010. 2010 is the, the earliest sort of real example of a, a spacecraft on a printed circuit board. Um, before 2010, there was this notion of um, building a spacecraft as a single integrated circuit, like out of a single piece of silicon. And that idea is still around. It's just more difficult to actualize because you have to go to like a nano facility and manufacture these things. Um, so 2010 saw the first example of a spacecraft on a printed circuit board. This was built by um, a graduate student that was in Mason's group before I was, Zach Manchester. We overlapped a little bit. He's a professor at, um, at Stanford now, still investigating these sorts of ideas. But this is this picture, this is a picture of one of these early chipsets. All that this did was send out a radio beacon. These were placed on the outside of the International Space Station for a year. And the experiment was just to see how well do these off the shelf surface mounted electronics do exposed to the space environment. So they got stuck on the outside of the space station for a year and then they got brought back inside, put back into a capsule and sent back down to earth and then back to the lab and they all still worked. So it does not prove that every chipset will survive a year in space, but it proves that at least they have a non-zero probability of surviving, right? In 2013, um, the first Kicksat launched and that carried this iteration of these chipsets. This again was, this, this was essentially a the chipset version of a Sputnik. So all that these did was beacon a radio transmission that was picked up by ground stations. And the, um, the point of this mission was to show, yes, we can indeed pick up radio transmissions from a transmitter as low power as this over distances as far as orbit to ground. That was something that sort of needed to be proved out. So this was, Kicksat 2 was, was considered a success because a radio transmission from a chipset was picked up. In 2016 uh, was the first, that was the first, my first contribution sort of to this uh, story. This chipset was largely a, an iteration upon the previous version. Um, same microprocessor with some new bells and whistles. Uh, new sensors, embedded torque coils, these sorts of things. Um, however, what I want to spend time talking about is this version of the chipset, which, which really represents um, quite a technological step forward. And it's the one that I spent most of my PhD working on and developing. So this, this chipset is what I'm going to talk about uh, from a technical perspective. And it's one that I affectionately call a monarch. And I'm very proud of my little logo here. It's pretty cool. So this is the Monarch is different from previous iterations of the chipsets. Again, in some ways that are visually obvious and in some ways that are not so visually obvious. Um, one of the most obvious differences between the Monarch and previous versions of the chipsets is it's a little bit bigger from a surface area perspective. The previous versions were three and a half by three and a half centimeters. The Monarchs are five centimeters by five centimeters. Um, that was, in some ways you could think about that as almost a step in the wrong direction. The whole idea has been to shrink these things down smaller and smaller. Um, there were some good reasons that I'll explain for making it a little bit bigger. 
And it's actually made of a different material from the previous um, chipsets that I'll talk about. It's made from Kapton as opposed to FR4. So despite being a bit larger in surface area, uh, it's actually about half the mass of the previous iterations of the chipsets. And my goodness, they'll still fit in your wallet. They're not that big. Um, but the, the motivation for making it a little bit bigger than previous versions was in order to accommodate these new solar cells. So these Alta Devices solar cells, which are five centimeters long, they produce, each one of them will produce 300 milliwatts, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually the, the previous iteration of the chipsets, the solar cells they used produced 40 milliwatts. So whatever 300 divided by 40 is, it's a lot more power. So in making these just very slightly bigger, I could accommodate these new solar cells. And with that extra power, it opened up the opportunity to include some really exciting sensors that would have been impossible to include without that power. So that was the fundamental motivation for making these things a little bit bigger in surface area. Um, the solar cells themselves, they only weigh 0.1 grams and they are flexible which is cool because the whole board's capped on. So the whole board is flexible. Um, unfortunately, this company has gone out of business. So I don't know how easily I'll be able to get these solar cells anymore. I might need to find an alternative. But anyway, that was the motivation. Probably the most exciting sensor that that extra power enabled was a GPS. So each of these boards carries a GPS, a GPS antenna, and a little LED indicator. So when it gets a GPS fix, it starts flashing its LED. Um, this is exciting because most of the experiments that are going to be done with chipsets, at least in the near future, are going to be in low Earth orbit. And if you're doing experiments with chipsets in low Earth orbit, there is, um, it is prudent to not deploy them above a certain altitude so that they deorbit quite quickly. These will deorbit. If you deploy these from the space station, they burn up in the atmosphere in like three or four days. So they clean themselves up. But this is cool because if we, de if we deploy them beneath the GPS constellation, then we can individually track each one. And just tracking where a collection of thousands of little spacecraft go is an interesting experiment in and of itself for studying things like debris propagation. In some ways, these are like smart debris, right? You could do smart debris experiments with these. And that wouldn't have been possible without the GPS um, the GPS module. And for doing things like atmospheric studies where you care about like where you are when you're taking your measurements, this just allows us to know where we are, right? So it, it this opens up a whole world of um, scientific experiments that would have been impossible without knowing where the sensor actually is. So that's exciting. Um, each one of these also carries uh, its own radio and it has an embedded radio antenna. This was for one of the things I was trying to optimize with these is manufacturability. I want these things to get, be able to get stamped out of a machine so that I can just order 100,000 of them and they will show up at the door and I don't have to put anything on myself. Um, for previous iterations, the bottleneck in the manufacturing process was the antenna. They had external dipole antennas that had to be manually threaded and put onto the boards by our lab. And that was by far the slowest part of manufacturing these chipsets. So embedding the, the antenna in the PCB allows for the whole board to just ship completely manufactured already so that all that we have to do is program them, but they're actually already built by the time they show up at the door. Um, and then in order to, to tune these antennas, each has a, a very, very tiny coaxial interface to the antenna. So I can plug that uh, via a very small coax cable into um, a network analyzer and get the antenna tuned just properly for each of the, each of the boards. Each, the, one of the less obvious upgrades um, between the Monarch and previous iterations is the processor. So for those of you that are familiar with these things, the, the previous processor was an MSP430 architecture. This processor is um, an ARM, which is, is just far more capable. So it's an ARM processor and has a built-in radio and it's running a real-time operating system, which just makes building software much easier. So it is much easier on this microcontroller to build up sophisticated software and modular software than it is on something like an MSP430 architecture. So from a development perspective, this was as big of an upgrade as anything else. It just made it so much easier to write complex software for this. 
Um, another sort of taken for granted upgrade is this has a standard JTAG interface. So JTAG is just, it's a, a protocol for debugging microcontrollers. And the previous versions of these did not have this interface for the microcontroller. So having this interface, um, it just means that all of these sort of software debugging tools that an embedded programmer would expect to have at his or her disposal for doing software engineering is available to the programmer, um, which was not the case for previous iterations. Uh, and then some other bells and whistles. Each of these has a loop of wire running. It's a four layer PCB. The inner two layers are loops of wire that go through the whole board. And using a, a motor driver from an RC car, um, I can drive current in either direction through this board, which means I can, I can do, we learned about torque coils right in this class and how you can dump momentum from the spacecraft or change attitude using uh, interactions between uh, a created magnetic field and the Earth's magnetic field. That means that this is now possible for these boards, right? So I can do something like attitude control with these torque coils. I say something like because it's not three axis control. I can only make it process around the local magnetic field vector. And then just the, the last few sensors that I'll mention. Uh, each one carries an accelerometer, magnetometer, gyroscope, and thermometer, and two ambient light sensors. And then this is a, light, a better view of uh, an unassembled one. You can better see the material that it's made out of. It's this Kapton, which is flexible and very lightweight. Um, so it's a flex PCB. This technology for flex PCBs, as far as I understand, was made um, uh, as, as relatively cheap as it is by the wearable devices industry. So things like Fitbits, where you have to bend electronics to organic form factors, necessitated flex PCBs. So I'm taking advantage of that capability from, from these sorts of industries. And there you can see the torque coils there a little bit better. So uh, I'm not going to talk off through, through all this again, but this is all of the hardware that I just talked through sort of labeled um, and all of the capabilities that I just talked to labeled. I don't think there's anything here worth mentioning. The, oh, the only other thing maybe I'll mention is that um, all of the sensors, in addition to being chosen for their particular capabilities, they were chosen for their operating temperatures. So all of the sensors were chosen so that they would survive um, the thermal environment of being in orbit around the Earth. So the whole board has a very wide uh, temperature range by design. You'll notice that it does not have a battery. Uh, the reason for that is um, there, at least at, at the time that I was putting these together, who knows, these things change so fast. Um, there was not a commercially available battery that fit the size and um, form factor that I required and that had an acceptable temperature range. And for on a conventional satellite, the solution would be to use something like a, a heater, keep your battery warm. That's what most satellites do. In this case, because these things have such little thermal mass, they reach equilibrium so fast, it would, it would cost more energy to keep the battery warm than any battery that's, that would fit on here can store. So it's not a good trade yet to include um, energy storage on these things in the form of a battery. So what that means is when they're in the sunlight, they're awake, and when they're in eclipse, they're asleep. And on a conventional satellite, that would not be okay. But here, if I can deploy 100,000 of them, maybe I'm okay with half of them being asleep when they're in eclipse. Right? So it's, it's a, different, a different architecture. And I'm not going to play this, but um, in case you don't believe me, you can find a demonstration video and, and you should be skeptical. You, should, you can find a demonstration video of all of these capabilities on my um, YouTube channel. So that's, uh, that, is, that is what the chipset is. What are they good for? And to my thinking, these these chipsets as tools are generally useful for missions of two broad varieties. Um, they're useful for missions that involve massively distributed sensing or distributed monitoring. So a spatially distributed area, things like an upper atmosphere, for example. 
And they're also useful for missions that pose high risk to individual chipsets or to, to individual satellites. And I'll talk about that in a moment as well. But a good example of this would be something like um, entry, descent, and landing missions, right? Very, very dangerous for conventional satellites. Spacecraft like this open up a new way to do planetary surface studies. And I'll, and I'll talk about precisely what I mean. So I'm gonna talk about both of these. I'll start with distributed sensing and monitoring missions, um, which brings me to this next contribution that I'm gonna talk about, which is an algorithm that optimally routes information through a planar swarm of spacecraft. So um, one of the missions that you might consider doing with satellites like this is carrying many, many of them into orbit in some sort of a mothership and deploying all of those and then using them to um, gather data over some distributed area, right? And in order to do this efficiently, you need some sort of method for moving data through this very large collection of spacecraft. So what's a good way to do that? Um, that's what I spent some time investigating. And the, the, uh, the fundamental, I'm sure that this is very laggy on your screens and that's okay. The fundamental observation, which is obvious to all of you at this point, after this class and previous classes, is that spacecraft on lower orbits are moving more quickly than spacecraft on higher orbits. So if we deploy a whole bunch of chipsets from some sort of mothership, and some get a little bit of velocity in the along track direction, and some get kicked in the opposite direction a little bit. And they all have sort of randomized orientation, so drag is affecting them all a little bit differently. They end up stringing themselves out. That's the observation. And, and I'll note, I, I will take a moment to note, I talked about these chipsets being sort of fundamentally different from conventional satellites. Th this is a, a good example of this. There's this question of how do you represent a collection of chipsets mathematically. And for conventional spacecraft, the way that we sort of represent the state of the spacecraft, at least its trajectory mathematically, is in the form of a differential equation. And this makes total sense because with differential equations, we can solve for precisely where the spacecraft is and how it's moving for all time, right? Which if a spacecraft costs, you know, a hundred million dollars, we care where it is, right? So so a differential equation makes sense as the mathematical model that we use to describe the state of that spacecraft, spatially at least, where it is. I would argue that for chipsets, we care less about, we don't really care where any of the individual chipsets are. Um, what we care much more about is the overall shape of the distribution of the swarm, I think. So what that means is that we're out of the world of I argue that if, if you're talking about descri mathematically describing a collection of chipsets, you are not in the world of differential equations and you're, said, and you're instead in the world of probability density functions. Where are most of the spacecraft spending most of their time? Um, which would make, again, this would make no sense for a conventional satellite, but for chipsets, I think this sort of mathematical model makes sense. So it's an example of one of these fundamental differences between this and conventional satellites. Um, so how do we move data through a collection like this? Um, the first thing to decide upon are, are what are the rules? And basically the, the, what I mean by that is what information is it reasonable to assume a chipset has access to? And what information is it unreasonable to assume that a chipset has access to? And I would argue that it's reasonable for individual chipsets to have access to their own position and velocity because they're carrying a GPS and we assume that they're deployed beneath the GPS satellites. So they have access to that information. I'm assuming that they have access to how fast the earth is rotating because this is just a parameter that we can, we can give them all that information. And I'm assuming that they all have a timer so they can measure the amount of time that has elapsed. What's unreasonable, I think, I think it's unreasonable for the chipsets to have knowledge of the number of nodes in the network. And this is for a couple reasons. Um, one of those reasons is chipsets are much more likely than conventional satellites to die. So if you deploy a thousand satellites, you can expect for the number of alive satellites to decrease from a thousand to zero at some rate that's kind of difficult to know. So if I'm making a routing policy based on some set of information, I would not like for the performance 
and this is an arguable point, but I would not, I, I would argue that you don't want for the performance of your routing policy to depend on knowledge of the number of nodes in the network, because that's a hard number to know. I want the performance of my policy to be independent of that information. Um, I also think it's unreasonable for the chipsets to have knowledge of the topology of the network, which is to say which chipsets are communicating with which, with, with which other chipsets and when. And the reason for that is the whole network is changing dynamically due to orbital perturbations, mostly from drag, but from other things too. And it's intractable for the chipset to keep track of all of this information. It doesn't scale. Um, this next one is an, is an arguable one. You wouldn't necessarily have to say this is an unreasonable piece of information, but I don't want the chipsets to have access to the locations of ground stations. Uh, and the reason for this is the ground station infrastructure required for communicating with these things is really just a piece of ham radio equipment and a laptop. So I would like a routing policy that allows me to go anywhere in the world and pop up a little receiver station and be able to make some guarantees about the swarm moving information to me in some way that's optimal. Depending, and I'll talk about what I mean by that, but I don't want the performance of the policy to depend on the locations of the ground stations. For different applications, you actually might, right? And maybe you would move this over to the reasonable column. For me, I, I, didn't, I wanted to derive a policy that didn't need that information. And then I also, uh, perhaps obviously, I don't assume that any chipset knows the position and velocity of any of the other chipsets for the simple reason that that doesn't scale. If you have a collection of 10 chipsets, then maybe they can all be keeping track of one another's positions. If you have 100,000, there's just no way, right? So I don't want a routing policy that relies on information, uh, on this information. I don't want to assume chipsets know what other chipsets are doing. What's this say? Um, and then this is maybe an obvious point, but the more information that's available to each node, the better the routing efficiency you can come up with. So in, in the limiting case where every node for all time knows the exact positions and velocities of every other node in the network, you could in principle always solve for the best path through that network because you would know everything about it. Um, I just don't think that's realistic, right? I don't. I think in a, in a practical situation, the chipsets don't know that information. So my question is, how well can you do in a realistic situation? That's, that's what I was considering. And the, uh, the case that I was considering as sort of a case study routing mission is, um, I suppose that I have some swarm of satellites that have gotten deployed and that have reached something like a steady state dispersion. And some node knows information of interest and it needs to move that information through the collection back down to some ground station. And I want to do it in such a way that the expected time from that node to the ground station is minimized, no matter where the node is and no matter where the ground station is. So you can set this up, this problem up as a series of optimal stopping problems. Um, an optimal stopping problem is one where you have a series of decisions and you are trying to decide when to stop. And the, the canonical example of this optimal stopping problem, which is maybe now like um, out of fashion, but it's a good way to understand this is, it's the marriage problem, is what an optimal stopping problem is. And the canonical example that you'll find in all the textbooks is, suppose you know how many people you're going to date, and suppose that you know, you're able to sort of rank these people relative to one another. The optimal stopping problem is, when do I get married? Right? When do I stop and when do I get married? And you can, you can frame this routing problem as a very, very similar one, where I'm the chipset with information of interest. As I travel along, I'm going to encounter other chipsets. When do I relinquish the data to the other chipset? So that's what the problem is. It's an optimal stopping problem. And you can set this up. I'm not going to talk through this in detail. Um, but you can set this up using what's called the dynamic programming equation. So as long as you set up the problem right, there's sort of a crank you can turn to get out of routing policy. And so that's what I've done. And um, again, this is gonna be too laggy to be of interest, but if you are interested here, there are a couple of um, examples of the routing policy in action. You can see the data moving through the swarm. Um, 
Okay. So they're useful for distributed sensing missions. I think they're also useful for very, very high risk missions. Missions for which the likelihood of survival of individual spacecraft is quite low. And an example of such a mission is a planetary impact one. So you might consider something like, um, suppose you want to study the surface of the moon or of any other celestial body really. Um, the question is, how do you get, what sort of entry, descent, and landing technology do you require in order to get chipsets safely to the surface of the celestial body? Enough chipsets safely to the surface of the celestial body. Like I said, you don't need everyone to survive. You just need some number to survive. And the question that I was trying to figure out is, uh, can you get away with none at all? Could you just shoot chipsets at the moon and have them impact the moon is there any chance, what is the chance that they would survive that impact? That's what I was trying to unpack a little bit. So this is the question. Would the spacecraft survive the impact with the moon? And in order to investigate this, uh, I worked with some folks, oops, worked with some folks at um, University of Maryland and with this startup called New Ascent. I'm not sure if they're still around. Uh, I think they are. They have this cool, this, this startup has this cool idea to build um, essentially a Jules Verne gun. I don't know if you guys have ever read this, this Jules Verne book, but the idea is to build a huge light gas gun to shoot stuff most of the way into orbit. So basically to replace the first stage of a rocket with a projectile and that would get you, that would, would play the role of the first stage of the rocket and then the second stage would turn on and accelerate you into orbit. Um, this would only work for pretty low mass payloads so they got in touch with us because they thought, hey, maybe the chipsets are a good candidate sort of payload for the type of thing that we would shoot into space. The, the, the technology is a light gas gun, in case you feel like Googling this stuff. But it's a huge light gas gun is what they want to build. Um, when you fire that gun, you can expect a lot of acceleration on the payload. So they wanted to, they wanted to know, would your chipset survive that acceleration? If we shot the chipset out of the gun, would it survive? Uh, so that's the question that we were, we were trying to answer, which was nice for me because it's basically very similar to the question of could you survive impact, right? It's just deceleration instead of acceleration. So I don't really care about the sign of the acceleration term. So it worked well for both of us. Um, so in order to investigate this, I got some lunar regolith simulant from NASA Ames. So this is not actually lunar regolith, but it's stuff that is manufactured to have many of the same properties as lunar regolith. And then I mailed this and a bunch of program boards to the University of Maryland, where they have this crazy drop table. It's elastically loaded. So you can think of like a platform on rubber bands that allows them to sort of yank a, a test payload up and let go and it slams stuff down into the ground at up to 27,000 Gs. So I slammed a bunch of chipsets into moon dust at 27,000 Gs to see how they would be affected. And uh, I expected that many of the sensors would be destroyed because these MEM sensors, they're based on um, things like tiny little cantilevered beams and stuff like this. So there's some sensitive mechanics going on in there that, that I imagined would be destroyed by the, by the impact. It turns out actually that every board survived just fine. So to be clear, this by no means is proof that chipsets will survive impact with the moon. But what it suggests is maybe there's a non-zero probability of a chipset surviving impact with the moon. And that's all I care about, right? All I care about is there being a non-zero probability of impact, because if I can put some sort of a number on what that probability is, I can just solve for the number to shoot at the moon if I want some number to survive. So that, so, so that, so I started playing with this idea. So suppose perhaps there is a non-zero, a non-zero probability of surviving impact. We don't know exactly what that probability is, but we know it's bigger than zero. In that case, what's the likelihood of mission success? So this requires that we decide what mission success looks like for this mission. And the way that I thought about this is let's think about mission success as 
some number of chipsets surviving, surviving on the surface of the celestial body for some number of days. Okay, so maybe mission success is five chipsets alive on the surface of the moon after a hundred days have passed. If we, ha if we have that number, then that's mission success. Um, so we can, we can start to put numbers on this thing. So we assume that we, we want J, some number J chips has to survive in order for mission success. We assume that we deploy some number N to the surface. That's going to be bigger than J because a lot are going to die. Um, we suppose that each chipset has some probability P1 of surviving impact. And then we suppose that it has some probability P2 of surviving each day. So every day it might die from something like radiation exposure. Uh, and then I make some simplifying assumptions that I can wave my hands a little bit just to sort of make some plots and get a sense of these things. Um, I assume that the probabilities do not change with time. That is to say, the probability of a chipset dying on day five is the same as the probability of a chipset dying on day 99. And I assume that chipset failures are uncorrelated. So if chipset A fails, that gives me no information about whether or not chipset B has failed. So, um, you, given all this information, then you can come up with, with an expression for the probability of J chipsets being alive on the surface for N days. And that looks like this expression, which is more interesting to look at sort of graphically. So what this plot is showing you is for varying probability of surviving impact and for various probabilities of surviving each day, what is the probability of mission success? where again, mission success is five chipsets alive after 100 days. And you can see some things that are obvious. If your probability of surviving impact is zero, your probability of mission success is zero. Um, and this assumes that we're deploying 100 chipsets initially. But this gives you some, some understanding of, okay, if we can start to narrow down what the probability of surviving each day actually is, and what the probability of surviving impact actually is. We can, we can come up with an expression for what our likelihood of mission success is. Or we can think about this differently, and we can say, you know, if we want five chipsets alive at the end of 100 days, we can allow for the number of chipsets that we deploy to vary. If we deploy less than, you know, 100 chipsets, our likelihood of mission success is pretty low. If we deploy 900, we start to be able to make some pretty decent guarantees about five being alive, right? So it, it's statistical mission assurance is the, ter the way I've been talking about this. It's figuring out how likely you are to accomplish your mission using statistics. Okay, so uh, all of these are great claims, right? So um, I claim chipsets are so useful for doing science on the surface of planets. Wouldn't it be nice if I had a planet to conduct some case studies on? And it turns out I do have such a planet. I have the Earth. So, um, which leads me to the next contribution, which is the first translational research application for chipsets in digital agriculture. So everything I've just said so far was really the motivating factor for this last thing, right? I wanted to substantiate my claim that chipsets are useful tools for doing distributed sensing and they're useful for things like planetary science. Um, so the thought was, let's gather the sorts of data sets that I would like to gather elsewhere in the solar system here on Earth so that I can go to the folks that design these missions and say, hey, look, here's a planetary data set. This one happens to be from Earth, right? But this is the type of data set that I would like to gather from the moon or from wherever else. So that was the idea. But as long as I was gathering these data sets, it would be nice if these data sets were useful for people other than just me, right? Which ended up with the help of a lot of folks at Cornell and ended up leading me to digital agriculture where I can get the data sites, data sets that I need to make claims about planetary science. And then I can give that data set to an orchard manager and they can inform their maintenance of the orchard. So in order to do this, um, I made a new version of the chipset, which was largely similar with a couple of differences. Um, the, ma the major differences were I swapped out those fancy solar cells for different solar cells that are just much cheaper because um, I wanted to make a lot of these. So I didn't have the funds to buy all those. So I 
cheaper uh, solar cells. And then because I don't need to worry about um, temperature variations as extreme as those in space, I included a uh, battery, so because I can. And then I also added some new sensors. So I added a more, a, a higher end temperature and humidity sensor. Um, those two data points seem to be the ones with, that the vineyard managers cared about, temperature and humidity. Okay. Um, and then I deployed them in, in vineyards. And the, the value proposition for these things terrestrially was to gather data that would enable cool climate vineyard managers to take preventative action against frost and fungus by providing real time in canopy temperature, humidity, and wetness data. So that, those are the data points that I was going to deliver to the uh, vineyard managers. So uh, I'm not going to talk through this, but there's, there's something like a business case for this. Um, vineyard and orchard managers, they inform their maintenance decisions, like when do I apply fungicide, when do I apply pesticide. They inform them using weather stations. Um, and you can drive up Cayuga Lake and look at these weather stations. They're on big white poles. But the, the way that these decisions work is there's a weather station next to the vineyard and you approximate the conditions in the whole vineyard by the conditions at the weather station and you make your decisions that way. The problem with this is um, in places like Ithaca, the environmental conditions can vary a lot within a vineyard. Uh, where there's terrain and where there's a lake, it, it, it can be the most extreme example I heard was Fox Run Winery, which is built on a hill down to the lake. The temperature difference from the top of that hill to the bottom was seven degrees Fahrenheit, which is, if you're in, for maintenance decision purposes, that's very different. That's a very, very different environment. So this isn't always a good approximation. So the notion is instead of one weather station, I can offer you a hundred weather stations, distribute them throughout the vineyard, and then you get a much more, a much more rich picture of the environmental state of your vineyard. Um, and the other advantage of these is you, they're small enough that you can place them in the leaf canopies next to the grapes. And the conditions within the leaf canopies are actually different than outside of the canopies as well. So that's the idea. Um, so that's what I did. So this is a picture of one of the chipsets at Anthony Road Winery, which is over on Seneca Lake, the other side of Seneca Lake. And uh, this is the data set that I gathered from there. You will see that this is only a 24 hour period. And the reason for that is I did not realize how hard it is to deal with rain. So at the top, you see temperature. At the bottom, you see humidity. This big spike in humidity is the beginning of a rainstorm that killed all the boards. So lesson learned. Um, but there's, there are a few other interesting things to point out here. The big dots are measurements from one of those conventional weather stations on site. Um, so the other problem that is apparent here is you can see that my temperature readings go up and down. And the reason for that is this was a partially sunny day. So clouds were coming and going. And when the sun came out, it was warming the boards and giving me artificially high temperature readings. So, okay, lesson learned. Oops and oops. So uh, the solution was, there's gonna be a more elegant solution in the future, but the temporary solution was to take a white styrofoam cup put it upside down and put the chips out inside. And there was still enough airflow for accurate temperature readings, but it kept direct incident sunlight off the board and it kept flowing water off the board. Um, a little bit of condensation was fine. Getting the boards even wet temporarily was fine. It's flowing water over electronics is so hard to deal with. So this, this took care of that problem. Um, so I set up a, uh, a receiver station up in Lansing this is a picture of that receiver station. This is a picture of the web application for viewing the data. Um, some details on the receiver station. It's nothing particularly fancy. A couple of solar panels charge up a battery that powers a Raspberry Pi with one of these software-defined radios plugged in. This all interfaces with a, just an off-the-shelf antenna and um, gathers all the data. And in this case, it stores it all on site and I would go and get it off uh, in the case that there's a Wi-Fi connection, it will send it all over uh, Wi-Fi to a remote server so that I can access it. This is what this looked like. And from this vineyard, I gathered um, five weeks of data. So this is, this is five weeks of data. Again, temperature and humidity. Um, I had the same problems with warming. I was getting artificially high temperatures on sunny days. 
So a problem that I think I have the solution to, but that I hadn't solved on this deployment. So we cannot do a fair comparison for that reason of temperature readings during the day between the, the monarchs and the conventional weather stations. Overnight, you can do fair comparisons. And um, you can see that actually, indeed, I was measuring cooler temperatures inside of the canopy than outside of the canopy, which according to the plant scientists here is not, not unexpected, but kind of useful. Here's a better illustration of that. This is showing cooler overnight temperatures and higher relative humidities inside of the leaf canopies. The leaves are, cap ca are trapping cool humid air and uh, the sensors in the leaf canopies are able to pick that up. And yeah, I have time. So um, the other thing I did, I was trying to stress test these, right? Because um, doing planetary science is stressful. So what, what, are, what are some other stressful environments that I can expose the chipsets to? Uh, I gave a presentation I forget where, but there was a vet professor in the crowd and he was trying to study respiratory infections in dairy calves and thought that this might be useful. So I ended up sticking a bunch of these on dairy calves as well. So this is a picture of one of the dairy calves. She's wearing a modified dog collar with a little chipset attached right here. Uh, here's another picture of a dairy calf wearing a little chipset collar. So I put, um, I put, I put these on 20 different cows and they stayed on for a few weeks and uh, set up a receiver station in the barn up at the dairy farm. They're impossibly cute. They, the calves were between one day and one week old. So the whole barn's full of these little things. And at that age, all they really know how to do is suck. So like you go in to work on them and they just like are sucking on your arm and stuff. They're like really affectionate. So it was really fun. Uh, but uh, the, the point of this experiment was not to, um, really the only goal was to gather a data set from the cows. Like if we wanted to do a full up experiment on the cows, there's a different set of sensors that would make sense. So the point of this was, okay, let's put them on the cows and gather a data set so that we can write a grant application that says, see, like we can indeed gather data from the cows by this mechanism and it doesn't bother the cows and it's persistent and all these things. So please give us some money to build the device that's actually useful for this experiment. That was the idea. So this is the full data set that I gathered from the cow. Uh, the top is temperature, this is relative humidity, and this is ambient light. The temperature, if I were to do this again, I had the temperature sensor facing out away from the cow. So this is a, a difficult to understand mixture of ambient temperature and skin temperature. If I were to do this again, I would flip it around and press the temperature sensor into the skin. And I think I could actually get a good skin temperature measurement that way. Um, so not much information there. There is some interesting information sort of unexpectedly in the ambient light measurements. Um, the ambient light sensors, they were calibrated such that they saturated high during the day and low during the night. But during each day, you can see that I would get this smattering of dark measurements. And it turns out that the calves sleep with their chins tucked in their forearms like this. So when they're napping, they are shielding the chipset from light. So a dark measurement during the day indicates a napping calf, which is unexpected and kind of interesting. So it turns out that the chipsets are able to pick up when a calf is napping. Uh, which is maybe useful for measuring activity levels and stuff like this. So that's the whole dissertation. That's all there is to it. Uh, the, so I hope that after this presentation, you at least approximately understand what chipsets are, why they're interesting, and what they're good for. Um, these are the, the uh, contributions that I've defended that I won't reiterate. So with all of that being said, I want to go back into 4160 mode. And I want to show you, this is the, the slide that I showed you at the, um, on the first day of the class. So this is what I hope you have taken away from this class. Uh, the goals were, and I'm going to read these out loud. The goals were to understand space missions and systems and how the space environment and, and mission requirements drive spacecraft design. To understand the fundamentals of spacecraft subsystems, including propulsion, attitude determination and control, power structures, thermal, 
communications and command and data handling. To understand typical practices for designing space systems in a contemporary context of US commercial space and government agencies. And then to simulate a spacecraft in operation at the level of a preliminary design review. We had to modify this a little bit because of uh, the world collapsing using state of the art tools and identify and characterize subsystems for a preliminary spacecraft design. So that's what I hope you took away from this class. I want to end this class with the same thought that I motivated this class with. Um, so this is what I hope you started this class thinking about. And as you leave this class, this is what I want you thinking about as well. Uh, these are all places. Everywhere that we talk about in this class, these are all places. And it's easy to forget that, but they're places in the same way that where you're sitting right now is a place. And if you're careful about it, you can get there. You can get there from here. So that is the thought that I want to leave you with. And I want to thank you all, really, really genuinely thank you all for this semester. It has been such an unbelievable privilege um, to spend this semester with you all. So thank you.